ESPN, celebrating 150 years of college football. Football is the only major college sport that crowns a champion by a sampling of opinion. Every year, it seems, some football team and its fans complains about getting shafted in the polls. People say, who is Clemson? Uh, ACC can't, can't compete with the Big Eight. We had to prove ourselves. When it comes to the polls and ranking a champion, nobody can or ever will agree. Coley O'Brien. Deep is Gladio. Well, nobody beat us in 1966. Well, nobody beat us either. That's what it's all about, the challenge and the desire to be number one. You got writers involved. You got ex-players involved. You got coaches involved. You got AP involved. You got UPI involved. I don't like polls because I think it's a, polls are an opinion. There's never an apples to apples conversation in college football. It's almost impossible to have it. College football is a rigged game in many respects, and that doesn't make it any less interesting. It makes it more interesting. NCAA football kicks off today, a season that will end for the first time with a national championship playoff. Think about Loa trying to make up for it. Fires to the end zone. Touchdown! Alabama wins! As great as the college football playoff is, it still screws up some of the most basic elements of this thing because there is no way that a group of five school can make the college football playoff. What you guys did is freaking impossible. There are about a million ways you could decide this and nobody would be happy with it. These guys deserve to be here. This, this team beat two teams that are in the playoff. American Game, presented by Cintas. The reason there's so much debate in college football is because a lot of it is subjective and a lot of it is based on interpretation. And the reason it's based on interpretation is because Alabama plays a different schedule than Florida State and Florida State plays a different schedule than Washington and Washington plays a different schedule than Michigan. And a lot of these conferences play nine conference games. Some of them play eight conference games. Some of them get eight home games. Others get six home games. So when you sit here and you try to decide, well, who is the best team? Well, that all depends. Today in college football, it is opinion, actually popularity that decides the national champion. Nobody sees all the teams. Like I cover college football professionally. There's only so many games I can see. I see the game that I may be covering that day and that's it. And then college football coaches, I mean, it's even worse because they're watching their team, they're watching their opponents, and they're not seeing anything else. And so that's why it's hard for people to agree because there's just no point of comparison. Well, I'll tell you this, Joe will admit it. I got a tougher schedule than Joe has now <laughs> to try to get back to the orange Here we bubbles. go. <laughs> All you have is the argument. All you have is your resume. We threw for this many yards against this team and our opponent, who we're not actually going to play, only threw for this many yards against this team. We're the only team in the country that beat the fourth-ranked team in the country. Now, no matter what them old boys from the West Coast, the Southeast, the Big Eight, or what all they say, there ain't nobody else in America that did that this year. If you happen to be one of the five powerful conferences, you're in great shape. If you're one of the five conferences now, that uh, aren't in the alliance, it's a lot harder because all the money is going to go to the powerful schools and conferences. Well, you've got the haves and then you have the have-nots, those from the other lesser conferences in terms of revenue. And they may take a hit. They're not going to be able to compete from a monetary standpoint with these other Power Five conferences. College football is different from every other American sport. Historically, they've struggled with deciding who should be the national champion. For the first 50, 60 years of college football, nobody cared who the national championship was. You know, college football was a very regional sport. So you were only interested in, was I the best team 
in the, the South or the West or the East, or what have you. Even Walter Camp wouldn't even try to speculate on who he thought the best team of the country was. Well, that all sort of changed in the mid-1920s. There was a economics professor at the University of Illinois by the name of Frank Dickinson, and he came up with a mathematical computation as to who he thought the best team was. The 1924 Notre Dame team is headed for an unbeaten season. New Rockney, the coach of Notre Dame, saw an opportunity. Oh, that's a cool idea. And has lunch with Dickinson and then convinces him, you know, as long as you're doing this, why don't you go back and maybe retroactively grade a couple of seasons in which New Rockney happened to have the best team in the country. So now, in 1926, he gets to now claim he had the national champion in 1924. Emma intercepts the Stanford pass, writing their names forever in football history as the first national championship. And so from 1927, you got the advent of the Dick Dunkel rankings and the uh, Williamson and the Litkin House and several others. And some were widely accepted, some had some regional bias, but they were actually published in publications and people are actually fighting over who is number one because someone actually is addressing the issue. That's kind of the way that these polls wound up working for a long time is that, you know, there were a lot of them and they were often conflicting. They were often based on certain regional biases. It was all about who is perceived to be the best team by this particular entity. The voters are men now mostly too old to play the game. They roam the sideline or watch from here in the press box. We call this voting method a poll. Alan Gold is an Associated Press sports writer. He starts ranking teams in his column, but eventually the AP establishes its own poll. The AP poll kind of becomes the gold standard because it's, it's thought, you know, this is a journalistic organization, so they're gonna have some integrity to it. You have to find some body of thought that, uh, that is looking at, a, let's say, 90 to 100 teams, and I suppose you have to turn to the fellows in the press box. But of course, it's ridiculous for a man who only sees uh, the Pacific 8 Conference to uh, pass judgment on whether or not Penn State is a good team, or perhaps even whether or not Texas is a good team. So there's no good way to rank these teams fairly. This is just the most quote unquote impartial judge we can get up to that point. The most widely publicized polls are the Associated Press, made up of a group of national sports writers and broadcasters, and the United Press International, composed of 35 college coaches. So after the war, AP's got a competitor, the UP, the United Press. They are looking for a different angle, and they make a deal with the American Football Coaches Association so that the coaches vote in the UP poll. Immediately in college football came the writer's poll and the coaches' poll. And they didn't always agree, and everybody was okay with that. It was okay to have more than one national champion. Why was that okay in college football? There was no way that the Bulls were ever going to make a deal to have a playoff. There's a foundation that's being reported in the papers this morning called the National Collegiate Football Foundation out of Philadelphia. They're going to petition or have petitioned the NCAA to have a <clears throat> national champion playoff on the 14th of January. Uh, I don't think that will ever happen, and this comes along about this time every year, and the NCAA will not sanction this uh, event, but, uh, and I doubt whether we would play. Well, keep in mind who is angriest about the lack of a centralized playoff structure. It's the fans first. There are always those who will argue that no reasonable appetite of the American sports fan should ever be denied. 80s and coaches aren't staying up at night in the 1980s, really beating themselves up about it. In fact, if anything, if five or six head coaches can ridiculously claim the same national championship in the same year, so be it. The Bulls are so lucrative and the Bulls are so influential, they're blocking this change at every step. You have a three-year agreement out in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, between the Pac-10 and the Big Ten. It pays $10 million this year. The Pac-10 and the Big Ten are splitting $10 million, $11 million, and $12 million. They're not going to give that up. No way. I mean, it's, you want to blame somebody, blame the Bulls, flat out. We won't say it won't never happen. We just hope it won't ever happen. It's a safe bet a true college football playoff system will come but not in the decade that is about to begin or in the century that is about to end. I, I think eventually we'll have one. 
uh, when that timetable will be, I don't know. I, I, th I think it's well in the future. too far, worked too hard. Uh, everybody just believed in themselves. We had 60 guys, a group of coaches, and that's it. We hung together and it feels really good right now. I'm going to the Rose Bowl for the first time. I can't believe it, but I'm going to the Rose Bowl. Mom, Dad, everybody, I'm going to the Rose Bowl! The Bulls established themselves as fixtures in college football, and then when national championships became important, the Bulls were, they were just in the way, but they got there first and people loved them. And it all started with the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. I don't think there's a more perfect place to play a football game than the Rose Bowl. It's the sun setting on the San Gabriel Mountains in the distance behind the Rose Bowl. Being there in downtown Pasadena on the day of the game and just the environment, the feel is, is unlike any other venue for any other bowl game in college football. It's a football mecca, and as the late, great Keith Jackson would always say, The granddaddy, the first and most famous of them all. Hello, I'm Keith Jackson. You know, an awful lot of college football history has been made right here in this great big oval. To think about the legendary coaches and players who have played in the Rose Bowl, it makes you want to tear up to think about how cool that place really is. The national championship on the line right here. He's going for the corner. David goes in zone, grab, touchdown. They fell again. Rolling out. Intercepted, Charles Woodson. Well, that's what I went to Michigan for. I went to play in the Rose Bowl. The good city fathers of Pasadena, California, were trying to promote their town. And they had a Tournament of Roses festival around the new year. They used to have chariot races. And then somebody hit upon the idea of, let's have a football exhibition. Well, the first one they try is Michigan and Stanford right after the turn of the century. And the game is so one-sided. Michigan is ahead 49 to nothing in the third quarter, and the game is called off. Well, clearly, that was a failure. So they ditch the football game for about 14 years and go back to chariot races. Finally, they decide to give it another try. And this time, match up a West Coast team against a team from the Midwest or the East, and it captured the imagination of the public. People fell in love with it, and the idea that you could play in this great game, and if you were picked, that was an indication of how good you were. In Pasadena, the biggest ever Tournament of Roses Parade heralds the oldest of the bowl games, the Rose Bowl. Eight million individual blossoms beautify the spectacle, which attracts a million and a half spectators. Remember, the Rose Bowl's formula is tourism and bringing people to the warm weather at New Year's Eve. Well, Pasadena is not the only warm place in America on January 1st. Other cities across the Sun Belt seized on this idea. They peel the wrappings off a thriller in the Orange Bowl. It proves to be the game of games among the bowl tilts. Miami started the Orange Bowl in the 30s. New Orleans started the Sugar Bowl. New Orleans, the Sugar Bowl. On the Cotton Bowl, played in Dallas. Cotton Bowl Classic is in for one of the Southland's great industries. The stadium has been twice enlarged and double-decked to its present capacity of 75,500. The bowl games made college football unique. Not just another football game. A bowl game used to be a positive self-gratification for a lot of players and a lot of programs and a lot of fans because that was what everybody wanted to do. I mean, it was, can we go to a bowl game? This is like the Super Bowl of college football right here. The bowl games, those traditional postseason celebrations, 18 of them now that provide between 50 and 60 million dollars for the 36 participating teams. There's a whole bowl ecosystem. You get invited to a bowl, 
because this bowl thinks that your team will get a big TV audience, thus bringing in more money, you're gonna get money, uh, and you're gonna bring in fans. Well, they fill the hotels, they eat in the restaurants. The town makes money. And so the bowls became the showcases. Joe, congratulations. congratulations. For years, winning the Rose Bowl was enough. And after World War II, the Big Ten and the Pac-10 had an exclusive contract between the champions of those conferences to play every year. Woody Hayes and Bo Schembechler, those guys really didn't talk about winning the AP national title. That was nice, or the UPI coaches poll. Winning the Rose Bowl was enough. On behalf of some great Wolverines, Let's go, I accept this trophy. The controversy rages. Should there be a national playoff for college football? The bowl system was and still is extremely powerful. And they did not want to change that system. Why would they want to change that system? They were the ones making all the money. 18 bowls. And you know what you have out of that? You have 18 winners. But you have more than that. You, you have 36 institutions getting an opportunity to play. And there's an old adage in the South, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that's what they're going to say, and they're going to fight. One of the ways the Bulls are fighting is by sweetening the pot with commercial sponsors. The Mobile Cotton Bowl, the Federal Express Orange Bowl, for instance. When I was at the Orange Bowl, we had this, we had this garden of great opponents that we could bring in to play the Big 8 champion. Penn State, Notre Dame, Miami. It's one of the reasons that we brought in Federal Express to be the title sponsor, we could now pay more. The bowls are too important to college football. I think we have to preserve the bowl structure. Bowls have been here as long as I can remember and you and any of us can remember. For them, preserving the status quo was the most important thing. The only way I would even want to consider a playoff to me would be within the framework of the bowls. And I don't know if we could do that, but to me, the bowls are the playoff. <laughs> is in position for a national championship. Bosco. Bosco down the middle. And he's got Haysburg down there. Haysburg's got it. He's going to score a touchdown for Brigham Young. Two things happened in the 80s that changed the way we identified a national champion. One was Penn State and Miami in the Fiesta Bowl, and the other one is BYU. He's going to score five touchdown BYU. The Cougars of Brigham Young University played their best football ever this season. The team is now ranked number one in the country in the two wire service polls. BYU's national championship in 1984 it was an anomaly for a lot of reasons. It, it, for one, it was BYU. They were in the Western Athletic Conference, not one of the major conferences. I think the problem is that they're playing in what is considered one of the weakest conferences we have in Division I football. They had the great good fortune to go undefeated in a year when nobody else did. Gets it off. He's got Smith at the 30. Gets by a man. He may score. 20, 50, 10, 5. And you could start playing that this one beat this one beat this one beat this one. And every time you did it, you ended up with BYU standing alone. How important is it really, either to you or OU, to, uh, you know, to be ranked number one at the end of the season? Well, you're always striving to be the very best that you can, and that, of course, represents uh, number one. And, and I think it's extremely significant for us because uh, our part of the country and, uh, and our conference, and uh, there's never been a number one team from the Intermountain area. Now, you have to remember this was in the days before metrics when we could analyze what happened on the field and decide that a team that had one loss or two losses because of its better competition was really the better team. We didn't do that in the mid-80s. They got plenty of time to go their way. Third down play. Bosco looking. Campbell throws it. Touchdown! At the end of the year, BYU was the only team left standing undefeated. And the way the pollsters voted, they saw the zero in the loss column and rewarded BYU with a national championship. 
All right, final score, Brigham Young University 24, Michigan 17. Jay Monson for myself and Steve Young from the Holiday Bowl. Honest thing about it is that the Holiday Bowl was not on January 1st where we are used to crowning national champions. They don't get the confetti. They don't get the trophy presentation. Everybody's got to wait to see if somebody who wins on January 1st might get enough votes to overtake BYU. Uh, Orange Bowl, big game. Some people say maybe the biggest game of the year. Oklahoma, number two. Some people say number one against Washington, number four. What, what do you expect? What kind of games are going to be? David, I'll tell you, for the week down here in Miami, there's been more talk about who's number one than there is the bowl. As you know, determining a national champion is an inexact science at best. 70% said they're awaiting the outcome of the Orange Bowl before making their final decision on number one. 20 different things had to happen, and this had to happen, and then this, and this, and this, and this, for BYU to even be considered. And so a lot of times people say, oh, BYU didn't deserve the national championship, and I get really mad. Yes, they did. They did what none of those other teams could do that season, and that was be undefeated. Now let's find out what the coaches of tonight's game think. I lobbied for our team to be the national championship, our bowl game playing in Washington. We've got to view this game as for possibly the national championship. They had an opportunity to see Brigham Young play in the Holiday Bowl against Michigan. They struggled in the fourth quarter to beat a team that was six and five. I think that uh, Washington and Oklahoma deserve attention for the national championship. You know, we're, we got lobbied for our game to be the national championship game. Well, uh, it wasn't. Now into Penny, and he's into the end zone. We didn't take care of business, and we lose to Washington, and... Uh, We'd won, we'd probably have been national champions. You know, all these teams that were the teams that, to beat lost, and that provided the opportunity for BYU. The NBC poll of the Associated Press indicated the support would be for Brigham Young, no matter what Washington won by. I, I just uh, have never felt like we had to apologize for our schedule or the people that we played. Now we pay a lot more attention to strength of schedule. A hey, Boise State, well, they didn't play enough people. Uh, UCF, well, you know, look at the strength of schedule. Maybe that's the legacy of BYU. Miami Vice and Crime Story will not be seen tonight so that we may bring you NBC Sports special presentation of the Fiesta Bowl. There's so much we take for granted about college football now that really started with Penn State and Miami and the Fiesta Bowl in January of 1987. There was a list of the big four in the bowl games, the rose, the sugar, the cotton, and the orange. And the Fiesta Bowl kept knocking on that door, wanting to get into that club. And those four bowls kept stiff arming the Fiesta Bowl away. Well, they kept coming back and they found new and different ways to do it. And one of the things they did was they got a title sponsor for their game. That meant more money for the Fiesta Bowl that they could then use to pay teams. Well, that was an outrage. You know, you're gonna have a corporate name as part of your bowl? Penn State is an independent program at that point. Miami's an independent program at that point. So there's a way for them to play each other. So they say, we're gonna match them up. And not only are we gonna do that, we're gonna move this game to January 2nd so that it's all by itself. This was considered a violation to the traditionalists who wanted their college football on January 1st. How could you do this? We welcome you to a special game played under special circumstances. The four annual games, usually thought of as the major bowls, were unable to create a championship matchup this year. But the Sunkissed Fiesta Bowl, anxious to increase its own prestige, could. NBC moved the game from New Year's Day to primetime the next night, and a unique college football showcase has been created. This is the only game that people are watching, the only game that people care about. This is gonna be the real game of the century right here. Now in the last couple of days, you've seen a lot of bowl games, and you see a lot of players mugging to the camera going, we're number one. That's out the window. The battle for number one is tonight. Miami was nouveau riche in college football, and they dominated the 1980s landscape. Browns after him, and he's got it. Penn State was not that far ahead of them, but, but certainly compared to Jimmy Johnson in Miami, Joe Paterno and the Nittany Lions were an established power in the game. And with Vinny Testaverde, the Heisman winning quarterback for the Miami Hurricanes, nobody really gave Penn State a chance to beat Miami. Nittany Lions did a masterful job of mixing up their defenses, confusing Testaverde, and he kept trying to will the ball into his receivers. As time slips a bit, throws, it's intercepted by Coleman stumbles and falls. 
and he kept throwing interception after interception. It is intercepted by Gatopoulos. And this explosive Miami offense can only get 10 points on the board. And it's Dozier. Dozier scores. Penn State puts up two touchdowns. They're leading 14 to 10. Miami makes one last drive. Penn State has done it again. An incredible upset, and Joe Pye gets his second national championship. The Penn State Nittany Lions are the national champion. Ooh, it's the highest rated game in college football history up to that point, and public opinion starts to turn. And people say, well, this is what we want. We want to see a national championship game. And it changes the entire perception of what bowl games are. This is, no shame. this is the way you win a national championship out on the field. Well, I always hoped you would that way. I think our kids played a, a great game. They beat a great football team. Now, congratulations, Coach. You guys are number one. Well, I think so. You could talk about numbers, but there's only one that counts, and that's number one. The playoff debate turned red hot in 1991, when unbeaten Miami and Washington were voted co-champions, having never met on the field. The same split a year earlier with Colorado and Georgia Tech. We get into the early 90s and we have a split national championship in 1990. We have another split national championship in 1991 and people are getting upset. The question of the day or the question of the season is, who is number one in college football? The answer after the dust settled on New Year's night is take your pick. This is the writers and broadcasters poll. According to them, Miami is their national champion. Then about three and a half hours later, the coaches poll was released. According to them, Washington is the national champ. The Huskies outpointing the Hurricanes by nine in that poll. What is best for college football is that the two best teams with the two best records play for the national championship. And that's not happening. Now, I always thought, who cares? Let them get upset. All it means is that two schools get to sell national championship t-shirts. It's great for business. You know, two schools get to buy rings. Who cares? What's amazing is that when the NCAA split into two divisions, 1A and 1AA in the late 70s, they immediately set up a playoff for the 1AA teams that, as far as we know, has gone perfectly fine, has not been the death of football for those schools. Uh, the difference is there's not as much money involved. And so that obviously caused a lot more complications. The obvious way to resolve the split poll problem is with a playoff. Playoff, that's something I would love. That's telling you the truth of the national championship. The only fair way is to have a, you know, 16 teams and go at it and play it off, and neutral sites and pair them up. And uh, then you'll have a true, true winner. So now we get the bowl coalition. And on paper, that's what it's going to be, cooperation. The reality is, Everybody's still kind of looking out for themselves. It's a mess, and the conferences are involved, and if you win this, you're going there. Everybody's still locked in. Then we go to the Bowl Alliance. By name, it's different. The reality was it's still that different. The Rose Bowl's still kind of doing its own thing. So this is the Rose Bowl, the 84th play of the Grand Ole Game in Pasadena, California. At the end of the 1997 season, you had the perfect example of what college football was at that time. Michigan was number one in the AP poll and the coaches poll at the end of the regular season. Rishi rolls out, still got it. Michigan had to go to, to the Rose Bowl under contract. Let's it go big for Ty Street. Touchdown. Wins the game. Michigan wins 21 to 16. Is crowned champions of the AP, but Tom Osborne announced he was retiring. We won 13 and that's all we played. And I'm very proud of these guys. The coaches vote Nebraska number one in what many thought was a going away present for Tom Osborne. And so even within the Bowl Alliance, we have a split title. Since the sun is out, we ought to just go outside and settle the whole thing. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll call it the Rose Garden Bowl. <laughs> that just showed you the system had to change, and it changed the next year. The Rose Bowl was the last one on board, and it really came down to, okay, the Big Ten and the Pac-10, who are partners with the Rose Bowl, saying, you know what, we, we really want to be a part of this. The Rose Bowl really had no choice but to come on board. The Rose Bowl made a very significant decision, and it was a painful decision. 
they had to sell a piece of their soul to join the bowl championship series in 1998. This is ABC Sports, home of the Bowl Championship Series and the National Championship game. It was finally, at long last, starting in 1998, we're going to make up a formula and then, of course, to use the polls together to determine who should play in the National Championship game. The one thing I want to say about a playoff system that I would like to see is I like to see it done by a computer, not by a popular vote. Don't pick the top two or four teams according to the popular vote. Let's pick them by a computer. In other words, hey, you hey, hey, so hey, much... hey, Lou, Lou, yes, the sir. world is being ruined by computers. Let a committee <laughs> do it. So the compromise they struck was that the polls agreed to be part of it, but not the only part of it. So then they go out and find these computer rankings that nobody knew what the formulas were for. So that was a problem. It's the Bruins of UCLA and the Miami Hurricanes here on ESPN. The final weekend of the first year was, was phenomenal. UCLA had to play against Miami. If UCLA wins that game, they're in the championship. McNown for the end zone. He's got a man there, and it is overthrown. Kansas State, they were playing the Big 12 title game against Texas A&M in St. Louis. And Kansas State blew a 15-point lead in the second half. Florida State sitting on their couch. They didn't do anything that weekend. Because of these losses, they get to go to the first BCS championship game and play Tennessee. It's been 47 years since Tennessee football has brought one of these home. We've got a special place for it. Thank you very much. What drama on the first year of the BCS. Well, this is great. Next year, no problem. Florida State, that was Bobby Bowden's best team. They ran the table wire to wire. State. 2000, we had problems. You had Miami and uh, Florida State. Miami beat Florida State, but how does Florida State stay ahead of Miami in the standings to play, you know, Oklahoma for the title? The champions of the 67th FedEx Orange Bowl. As a team, we fully expected to win, and it's easy to say that Oklahoma's back. To complicate the issue more, Miami goes to the Sugar Bowl and beats Florida, and they come out thinking they should be national champion. I just hope that people recognize the fact we've won 10 straight. We beat the number one team, the number two team, uh, beat the number six team tonight. Uh, I think we got a shot. I think we ought to be national champions. And that was the first real kind of... Uh, a taint or a stench that came off the BCS, and then it, from there, it just it was it was a, a carnival. And there are two champions this morning in college football. This morning, the Associated Press picked USC as number one in its final poll. In the Sugar Bowl, Louisiana State beat Oklahoma 21 to 14. That gave LSU the Bowl Championship Series title, but the Tigers were second in the AP media poll behind USC. We are number one, and this is what we think about the BCS. Uh, this is Champions Day here at the White House, and it is my honor to welcome some great champs. LSU and USC. There was quite a lot of discussion about, like, who really was number one. My attitude is the South Lawn's pretty good size. The BCS was the absolute greatest thing that ever happened to college football writers because they just provided us with, with so much material to mock. You're now six years into it, which is supposed to be a unified national championship game, and they still had a split national championship, which was the whole, the whole reason this thing exists is to, to not have any more split national championships. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to the Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection Subcommittee's hearing on the current state of postseason college football and, in particular, the bowl championship series known as BCS. I'm not sure any of us understand, and it is really something that I wonder sometimes the federal government designed. I think it works something like this. Each Division I team earns a percentage point that is derived by dividing that team's actual voting points by a maximum of 2,850 possible points in the Harris Interactive Poll and 1,550 possible points in the USA Today's Coaches Poll. Then six computer rankings provided by Anderson and Hester, Richard Billingsley, College Well, the gentlemen, Anderson. slow down. This is very important information. I'm, I'm trying to help us understand this. Nobody really understood what was going into the computer 
to spew out what was coming out of the computer. And these were all proprietary formulas. You know, that's not the way to get the public support. Finally, the BCS average is calculated by averaging the percentage totals of the Harris Interactive USA Today coaches and computer polls, and that's all there is to it. I've prayed about college football for a living, but if you ask me to explain how any of those systems worked at this point, I have no idea. I don't think I even knew as they were going on exactly how they worked. I mean, it's like somebody sitting in their underwear in a garage somewhere is coming up with this formula for you know, who's going to be national champion of college football. I mean, really? College football has used the BCS to decide who plays for the title. Critics, though, say the system is broken and it leaves some of the best teams out. There would be issues with margin of victory, teams running up the scores to try to affect the polls. Well, then they decided margin of victory will not be included into these formulas. And the guys running the formulas are going, well, what do you mean we can't put margin of victory? Of course we should be able to put margin. Do you want this accurate or not? Every year they try and tweak the system a little bit more because over time certain schools figure out how to game that system. So year by year you see, really with the exception of, of years like Texas USC, there's often not a consensus one too. It's not possible. It's interesting that, that people of goodwill keep trying to tinker with the current system and it's, to my mind, you can't fix it. It will not be fixable. For years, all I heard was, we gotta take the human element out of it. We just we should just do it with computers and then that way there's no bias. And as soon as they turned the computers into it, everybody went, well, the computers don't know anything. <laughs> Send it back to the humans, they know football. Now, many of the media and the public favor a full Division 1A playoff, not unlike that of the basketball tournament. I do not. Not because I believe it's academically unsound, but rather because it would diminish the tradition and benefits of the bowls. One of the dirtier things about college football is that tradition, great, wonderful, awesome tradition, is often used as an excuse for people who are afraid of losing money to not do something that they should. That could affect the tradition. Maybe it's time for a new tradition. Boise State, they've got plenty of impact players on offense as well. This has been the highest scoring team in college football of the decade of the 2000s. Ideally, the game itself should be the only thing that's considered when ranking these teams, right? Boise State begin to build their case as a BCS Bowl worthy team. This guy is certainly worthy. Ian Johnson bursts up the middle. Touchdown number five. But that doesn't happen. Here's Johnson again. Has five, has ten, he's going to score. Boise, very impressive tonight in their big win. So the BCS essentially says, you know what? We will come up with an ever-evolving methodology of determining one versus two. Because isn't that what y'all want? This tells the entire story. Of course, it's Ohio State, Michigan, SC, and Florida. But look in the number 11 position. Boise State, 11-0. They're a great football team. They're one of two unbeaten teams in the country. Have to give uh, Coach Peterson, their staff, a lot of credit. Looks to me like they'll qualify and they belong in a BCS game. What will you do in the Fiesta Bowl? What will we do? We're going to go out there and play the same intensity we always do. And go out there and win another game. Boise State, really good football team that no one knew about. Oklahoma's a really good football team with a, a obviously a national reputation that wasn't quite as good as a normal Oklahoma team in a game like that. Boise State for the win. They hand it off to Johnson. Boise State has won the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. Now we go 13 and 0, we beat everybody on our schedule. We deserve a chance at a national title. It got so untenable as the years went on because you had teams like Boise State who could make the claim, are you sure you got one versus two? Because we're undefeated right now, but we're really not getting a chance. The argument you always hear, I'm not saying it's not true, but this is the argument. If Boise State played in the SEC, what would their record be? Okay. Uh, if they played in the Pac-12, would they be undefeated? Probably not. A lot of people thought that the BCS system was uh, not legal because these little guys did not have access to the system. Any Division 1A team has access to the BCS. Any team that is ranked in the top six at the end of the season has automatic access. In the last 12 years, only four schools outside the top BCS conferences have played in the richest BCS bowls. 
and never for a national title. The BCS wasn't designed to put the best teams in the championship game. It's designed to maximize revenue for the, uh, the big bowls that run the BCS. In 2011, the two best teams in college football are from the same conference and the same division. And this infuriates everybody. Jelly nails it. You had all these different corners of the country with no representation in the national title game at all. You go back to the Alabama LSU national championship game, right? Which, by the way, sucked. 21 to nothing. LSU barely crosses the 50 yard line. Plays, hammering away at the clock right now. And Richardson breaks free on the sideline. End zone. How about that? Finally, a touchdown. Between... And that was the culmination product in 2011 that college football gave to the world said, This is the best we can give you. This is our championship game. Alabama, they win the BCS championship behind. That. I think helped spur a playoff more than anything else. Well, on behalf of the presidents and chancellors who serve on the Presidential Oversight Committee, I'm really delighted to report to you today our endorsement of a four-team seeded playoff as part of college football's new postseason structure. The college football playoff is coming. And this season, everything matters. In 2014, the game declares its independence from arithmetic. Welcome to the college football playoff. Tonight, college football getting ready for the biggest game of the year. For the first time ever, a national championship, not a bowl game, will determine the number one team. It's emphatically better in every way than the BCS. Just like even the BCS was better than the old way, which was literally just like, all right, we finished, guys. Um, you're the best. Then we did this like super bizarre like conspiracy of computers and polls and averages and like shadowy rooms where people are deciding one versus two. And then we were like, hey, let's find it. Let's find people. Let's tell you who those people are. We're going to put them in a room and they're going to make a decision on one through four and they're going to play football. Oh my God. Why did that take 80 years? This selection committee of 12 with members such as former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and former Rhodes Scholar and USC Director of Athletics Pat Hayden watching film and scouring stats here in Selection Central since the start of conference championship weekend Friday night. We look a lot of hard data, but then in the end, our votes are somewhat subjective. It's what we believe the best teams are. Ezekiel Elliott. And he's got an opening. Elliott off to the races. Can they catch him? No, they can't. Touchdown. And there's Ohio State that comes in in the first ever playoff in the heart of the South, in New Orleans, at the Sugar Bowl, and just wallops Bam. 85 yards. It was like everything kind of changed for a second. It's not like the SEC got bad or Alabama got bad, but what that moment in the playoff did was reassure the rest of the country that this bracket system, even though it's only four teams, has a consequence to it. Because Alabama should have gone straight through and played either Florida State or Oregon. You know, Ohio State was an afterthought. They weren't supposed to be in there. Sims, deep, Hail Mary, not answered, intercepted. Ohio State's gonna win it. The dream continues for the Buckeyes. The nightmare starts for number one Alabama. They are no more. What is it about the college football championship you think that makes it so special? There is a whole new crazy atmosphere. It's just so exciting. And nobody expected us to be here. As soon as you made a playoff system, nobody talks about bowl games. Nobody's interested in that. People get fired now for having a good season. That would have been a great season in the past to go to a bowl game because they didn't get playoffs. The stage is set for this season's college football national championship game. Oregon and Ohio State will play for the title. Elliott dodged the eye of this national championship win. As great as the college football playoff is, where are the playoffs played? In bowls. They didn't really go away. Welcome to the Buffalo Wild Wings Citrus Bowl. We bring you the Advocare V100 Independence Bowl. There are 40 bowls that exist today. You know, the playoff gets all the attention, but the bowl system is still there. And it's a connection to college football's past. Cam Thomas runs right on first and 10, inside the 10, and he scores. Watch Army play Houston in their bowl game and tell me that game didn't matter to Army. 
Watch Eastern Michigan lose in the final seconds and tell me they weren't devastated and that didn't matter to them. These teams and these conferences that don't get a bowl trip every year, these games matter for a lot of these schools that don't necessarily have the rich college football tradition. Now it's Michelle's turn running all the way. Gets to the edge. Sonny Michelle will send the Ducks home to the championship game. We're not moving past four teams for at least another 12 years. Four is not going to be enough. The team five who's left out, our six that's going to be left out. Yep. They're going to be so upset. Their fan base is going to be upset. I think we're going to have to move towards six, eight fairly quickly. But this is a, this is a step in the right direction. There is that drumbeat of, well, we really need eight. You know, and, and I promise you that if they ever go to eight, the minute they announce it, it would be about 3.7 seconds before somebody complains, well, we really ought to go to 16, and, and off we go. Hastings in motion. Now the clock winds. Good rush. Did him under pressure. Throws it. Intercepted! UCF is 24 seconds away from perfection. The true freshman Collier. These guys deserve to be here. This, this team beat two teams that are in the playoff. I'm just happy for these guys. They, they've worked their tails off, and it's unbelievable to watch the success they've had. UCF finished undefeated and was not even given consideration to finish in the top four. I really think that the way the system is set up right now is unfair to those teams that are not in the Power Five conferences. I'm just so happy for you guys. And all year long, I watch this dumb committee throw another two-loss team ahead of you, then another two-loss team ahead of you. Then, oh, Stanford must be better than you, even though they have three losses and they lost to San Diego State. Then another team must be better than we have three losses. Bullshit. UCF has this magical season. They go to the Peach Bowl, they beat Auburn, who just won the Iron Bowl. And the team they defeated in the Iron Bowl, Alabama, somehow gets into the playoff. You do all that math, and UCF looks pretty good on paper. But in reality, they don't have a chance. When you're in a major conference, every week, there's something really tough. I think there is a lot to be said for strength of schedule. Do you really weigh their strength of schedule heavily when you're talking about how a team looks? Or do you look at whether they're blowing people out? If your strength of schedule is not up to speed, I don't know that you should be rewarded. I do think there has to be a seat at the table for one of those guys, because how fun would it be for that debate about UCF and whether they could hang with Alabama? That is part of what makes college football so great, is we can argue and get angry and really mad about it, and then an hour later go back to doing what we were doing before. <laughs>